never let me down. Continue to worship this morning as the choir sings Jesus never fails. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah.
chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. The word says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. <laughs> and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. And whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. Amen. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. The choir just sang a beautiful song. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit. And he's given us new life. <laughs> Does anybody in this building today believe in God the Father? Does anybody in this building today believe in Jesus Christ? Does anybody in this building still believe that there's a Holy Ghost baptized? And that he gives new life. I'm here to tell you if you don't know this Jesus, you better find him before you leave this building. Because I don't know what you're feeling out there in that congregation, but I feel the power of God on this stage. I feel the presence of the Holy Ghost. And I'm here to say, I believe. I don't know about you, but I'm here to tell you, I believe. And I've met this man named Jesus. I've met the one who's faithful. I've met the one who saves. I've met the one who was the propitiation for my sin. I've met him. And I'm here to tell you this morning, you can know him too. Yes, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm excited. Hallelujah. I'm excited about Jesus. Yes. I'm excited about what he can do in your yes. life. Yes. I'm excited about him this morning. I want you to stand with me. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Here's what I want you to realize in verse 1 before we pray. If you don't know who Jesus is, the writer of 1 John says he's Jesus Christ, the righteous. See, what I want you to understand today before we go to prayer is there's nothing inside of us righteous. Nothing. We're not righteous. But we can be made righteous through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. But this morning we can put on His righteousness. That all we have to do is say, Lord, I'm sorry. I come to you and I confess you, my Savior. Forgive me of my sins. And I'm going to walk after you. I'm going to lay my old life down. And I'm going to pick up the new life of righteousness that you have provided for me. And you know, when you do that, he comes in. <laughs> Last Sunday morning, the Spirit proclaimed to us that, the, that he was drawing somebody to him. I believe this morning the same thing, that Christ is drawing somebody to him for salvation. There's not a better decision you can make. Whether you're sitting in this congregation or whether you're watching online, or whether you listen to this broadcast on the radio, you can accept Jesus Christ as your Savior right now. There are going to be needs above me on the screen, but the biggest need in this room today is the need for a Savior. 
If you're sitting in this congregation today and you have a need, you just want to signify by the lifting of your hand, I have a need today, Pastor. I have a need, I have a need, I have a need. God can meet that need, but what I'm here to ask you today, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, please call on Him this morning. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today. I feel the presence of God in this building. I feel the manifest presence of God in this sanctuary. And Lord, we're coming before you this morning to proclaim that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. We're here today to proclaim we believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit today. Lord, we are still a Pentecostal church that believes in the manifestation of the Holy Ghost. We still believe in the gifts of the Spirit. We still believe that you move here on earth. And Lord, we're proclaiming your righteousness today. Lord, there's nothing righteous in me. Lord, but the righteousness that I have is because you have given it to me. Lord, we are clothed in your righteousness. And Lord, this morning I come before you just to proclaim that you are almighty. To worship you. To praise you. To glorify you. To magnify you today, God. Lord, we just say thank you. Thank you. And Lord, we come before you and ask if there's somebody that's in this building this morning that they don't know Jesus as their Savior. Lord, I pray they find you today. Lord, I pray they call on you. Lord, I pray that they say, Lord, I'm sorry for my sins and I'm turning from my evil ways and I'm giving my life to you. And Lord, I pray that you would just move in residence into their life, change them. Lord, create that new life in them that you promised. And Lord, I come before you on behalf of the needs of this congregation. Lord, I pray that you would reach down and touch every need. Father, you see the uplifted hands. Lord, you see what each individual is in need of. Lord, whether it's physical, whether it's spiritual, emotional, financial. Lord, I pray that you would reach down and touch these needs. I pray that you would touch the names that were on the board behind me. I pray that you would just reach down and minister to those needs today. And Lord, I stand here in this pulpit and I proclaim that we are still a church that believes in God the Father. We are still a church that believes in Jesus Christ. And we are still a church that believes in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Lord, I pray that you would just move in this service today. Lord, let revival fire burn in each one of us. Lord, let passion burn inside each one of us today. Mm. And Lord, we just proclaim your righteousness in this place today. Lord, we pray all these things in that name that's above every name. In that name of Jesus we pray. And the church said, Amen. Amen. It's so good to have you this morning in the house of God. It's so good to have your smiling, lovely faces sprinkled all through the congregation. If you're visiting with us today, maybe this is your first service, or you haven't been in a while, can you just lift your hand? We have some information we would like to get to you about our church. Anybody visiting with us this morning? Well, it's so good to have each one of you here today. Let's take a, mo a moment or two to fellowship together.
good to see you today. Glad you're enjoying fellowship together, getting to speak to one another. If you are our guest today, please let me join with Pastor Jason in saying how blessed we are that you're with us today. And if it's your first time with us, we hope that you will uh, receive a blessing, not, not from us, but from the Lord. That's what we're, this is, we're just, we're here to honor Him. We're here to bless Him. We're here to worship Him. That's what all we try to do here is about. It's about Him. Matter of fact, this morning in the office, I prayed and said, Lord, hide me. Put me behind the cross so nobody can see me. And don't let them hear my mouth. Let them hear your words. I hope that you didn't hear anybody uh, singing, but you heard the, the voice and the melody of the Lord. You didn't see anybody but Jesus this morning. That's, that's our hope and prayer today. I hope you got a news and highlights uh, out there so that you can see some of the things that are going on this week. We have prayer meetings uh, that happen on Monday night, Wednesday morning. Uh, we have service on Wednesday night. I just want to encourage you uh, to be with us on Wednesday night. We are, we are doing uh, a series of of messages that I've just called he said what and we're going through the gospels and we're only looking at the words of Jesus right now we've only covered Luke chapter 4 Luke chapter 5 and we're not even through Luke chapter 5 but I just want to tell you if Jesus said it it's important and, and I don't know of anything that's impacted me in studying to, to give but has impacted me like looking at the words of Jesus and understanding what Jesus said. If we could literally see what Jesus said and do what he said, we'd be dangerous to the kingdom of darkness. And so if you aren't coming on Wednesday night, we'd like to encourage you to come. Now things will change a little bit in March because of our revival time. We do worship Wednesdays where all we do is worship. We sing, we read scripture, we show videos in regards to worship. It is to, to fill our hearts and minds uh, with worship so that when the services come for revival, we are prepared. We've prayed, we've worshipped, we've fasted, we've done everything that we've been asked to do so that God can move and do the things He wants to do. In us. So we're, we're excited about that, and we're going to go with that as long as it takes until the Lord says stop. But uh, So I hope that you'll join us on Wednesday night. Next Sunday morning, we'll have an opportunity for church membership. If you'd like to, uh, to know more about us, if you'd have an interest in that at all, we'll meet at 9.30 across the street. Go in the door, mark staff, and go to the room just straight in front of you, and we'll meet you there. Uh, anytime you ever have questions about us, what we believe, what we, what we stand for, we'd love that opportunity just to talk with you and share with you and explain to you about our denomination, but about our own body, our own, our own congregation and what the Lord has said to us, and what we're trying to do, and what we are, are about in our community. So we love that opportunity anytime, but if you have an interest in membership, you can see us Sunday morning, next Sunday morning, 930 across the street. Our rushers are going to come and wait on us, and we're going to ask you to join with us as we give our gifts to the Lord today. Our tithe, 10% belongs to Him. We give that to Him gladly, and then beyond that, we give our offerings to say to the Lord how much we love Him and how much we support the work of God. So I hope that you'll join with us as we give our gifts today. Father God, we thank You and we praise You for Your love and Your care. We thank You, Lord, for every blessing that You have poured out upon us. And we ask You, O oh God, to meet with us in a special way. You understand all about us. You know all about us. And Lord, You have created us in Your own image. And Lord, then You have set in motion things that are helpful to us and Lord one of those great things you've set in motion is teaching us that Lord if we will recognize that you have blessed us and in turn give back to you what you require you're able to bless us in such a way that with what remains the greater blessing comes and we have the ability to do more with what is left than what we gave it teaches us that a portion belongs to you and that through obedience we give it back to you we do it gladly. We do it cheerfully today because we love you. Receive our gifts today and be pleased. We thank you for it in the name of Jesus. Amen.
myself back and good with you but what a waste what a losing game calls that's what the blood is for it cleans the dirt Where I am free in perfect peace. And what if I can't get my act together? That's what the blood is for. It cleans the dirty man. your blood that compels me oh yeah holds the power to my victory it's still speaking you love me
Turn with me this morning to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. And we'll begin reading at verse 35. Mark 8. I normally would have said yes, Lord, but I don't think that was. I don't think that was from heaven. Whatever that was. Mark chapter 8, verse 35. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? I want to continue this morning in talking about our theme for 2015. And that theme is passion. We've talked about having a passion for God. I can tell you about it. I can show you about Him in the Word. But you have to decide to become passionate about God for yourself. There are certain things that may happen to you. That will precipitate that happening. But you are still responsible for the passion. I'll say it. If you want more of God, you can have it. It's up to you. We talked about having a passion for the church. And I just want to go on the record today. I love my church. I love the church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee. I love what she represents. I love that when they were singing today, we, we believe in God the Father. We believe in God the Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit. That is in our doctrinal teachings. They were singing what we believe as the church of God. But I want to tell you, I love Woodruff, church of God. I love what she stands for, for what she represents, for what she has stood for all of these years. I love my church. Now, we may not be perfect, but I guarantee you, you won't find a perfect church anywhere. You won't find one. But do you know what? This church has a promise. It's really given to every church. It's found in the Word of God. Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. We have the promise that we are the church of God. Not the denomination, but we belong to Him. And if He builds His, we build this church upon the rock Christ Jesus, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And we have to understand, the church is not the building. The building is where we gather, but the church is the people who are inside the building. And it's time we, the church, become passionate about being who God called us to be. Doing what God called us to do. And we talked about being passionate about revival. Refreshing, renewing, coming to life again. How that revival starts with me. We get on our knees, we draw a circle around ourselves, and we say to God, start a fire inside this circle. Until men and women are willing to get on their knees and draw a circle around themselves and talk to God about themselves and until they get on fire and they includes me, we will never have revival. It is when individual men and women become set on fire with God that the collective body of the Lord that we call the church will become on fire for Him. The way Woodruff Church of God will have revival was when the individual members of the church of God experience revival for themselves. Today I want to continue with this same thought. And I want to tell you a fourth thing that we must be passionate about. 
This morning I want to tell you we need to be passionate about souls. In our text, Jesus has a crowd of people that he calls together along with his disciples. And he talks to them about things they need to do if they want to be followers of him. We talked a little bit about being a follower of Jesus on Wednesday night. Jesus says in verse 34, he tells him three things that they need to do if they want to be a follower. He said, turn from your selfish ways. He said, take up your cross. And then he said, follow me. Turn away from your selfish ways. Pick up your cross. Follow me. And then he expounds a little bit. And he goes a little deeper. And he says, if you try to hang on to your present life, you're going to lose it. But if you will give up your present life for the sake of the gospel, if you will give up your life for the sake of the good news, you will save your life. Now we go, what does that mean? Jesus, what are you saying? Jesus is saying that a lot of us like our life the way it is and we don't want to change anything. We don't want to go to hell, but we don't want to change anything. Jesus says, if you think that you can come and follow me and not change anything, what you're going to find out is you're going to lose your life. But what Jesus said is when you understand that the stuff you think is so important will never be more important than me. It will never make you more happy than I can make you. It will never make you more blessed than I can bless you. When you realize if you'll turn loose of that stuff, you can have your life. And then he asked a most profound question. Verse 36 and 37, let me read it to you from the New Living Translation. And what you do, and what do you benefit? If you gain the whole world and lose your own soul, listen to the question he asked. Is anything worth more than your soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? Now remember, Jesus is talking to a crowd of people who have evidently said to him that they want to follow him. They have an interest in becoming a future future follower of Jesus. And Jesus perceived that there were people there who were saying with their mouth they wanted to follow him, but they were not willing to let go of things that would prohibit them from doing that. So Jesus says, you want to follow me? You need to get rid of your selfish ways. You need to understand there's a cross that comes with doing what you're saying. You need to pick it up, follow me. You need to understand if you won't turn loose of some stuff, you're going to lose your life. And if you'll pick it up, if you'll, if you'll let it go, then what will happen is you will save your life. But you've got to answer this question. Is there anything you're doing? Is there anything you have? Is there any body, any circumstance, any situation, is there anything, anybody that is more important than your own soul? Brothers and sisters, can't nobody answer that but you. Can't nobody answer the question whether or not anything in your life is more important to you than him. This is a question Jesus asked every single person. Is there anything? If you're saved this morning, I still think we need to ask the question, have I allowed anything into my life that has become more important to me than Jesus? Because if it has, that's what moves us away from Him. That's what begins to put obstacles in our life so that when we need to hurriedly run to Him, we cannot hurriedly get there because some of us don't jump hurdles as good anymore. Things that didn't used to bother us. Things that didn't used to tempt us. Things that did not used to become an obstacle to us. All of a sudden now, because of where we are and how our walk has been affected, we no longer have the power. If I fall, somebody going to help me. We used to just kind of bounce back. I've had a check engine light keeps coming on in my truck. Aggravating. Got rid of an old car because it was aggravating. Now the truck wants to be aggravating. So I pull in. It was raining yesterday morning. I tried to go early. I pull in. 
and open the door, and the man says, be careful. Floor's wet. Tile floor, and it was raining. Well, I got on rubber bottom shoes. I ain't never had nobody tell me to be careful getting out of the car before. Who do you think he's talking to? Why are y'all laughing? <laughs> so I opened the door. I got on my rubber bottom shoes. I step out with my left foot. It says, whoop. <laughs> I'm grabbing to the door, grabbing to the handle. And I pulled something in my other leg. Now obstacles are in my way. And I need to hurriedly get to Jesus. But the problem is my mind says you can do it. But my body says, uh. (laughs) See, we can say, oh, how I love Jesus. And we can say, I'll follow you anywhere. I'll die for you, Jesus. I'll do whatever. But if we aren't careful and we allow obstacles to come into our life, when we quickly need to get to where Jesus is, We'll be like Samson who thought after he had his hair cut, I'll just get up and do like I've always done. But he didn't even know the Spirit had left him. So if we're saved today, we still need to ask the question, is there anything that has gotten in my life that has become more important to me than Jesus? And then this morning, There's somebody who is here in this room or somebody who may be watching us by internet, whether it's live or delayed or or you're listening by radio or, or however you're getting the word. You need to hear Jesus asking you the question, Dear sir, dear ma'am, is there anything in your life that is more important than Jesus? What will it profit you if you gain all of the world's wealth And lose your soul. My wife was showing me last night of a man who was buried in a glass casket with his Harley standing up and him standing up on the Harley. They buried him just like that. Listen, you can't take your Harley with you. Or your Mercedes, or whatever your favorite thing is. When you've drawn your last breath on this earth, the decision you have made about what you will do with Jesus determines where you go. And you can't take your coffers with you, and you can't take your wealth with you, and you can't take your riches with you. All you can do is if you go to heaven, it's the things you've laid up already in heaven as treasures. Is there anything? More important than your soul. Now flip over to Romans chapter 9. And I want you to see how Paul describes his people. He's talking about the Jews. But I want you to hear how he talks about them. Because from this passage, I want to give you three things that we need to understand when we're talking about passion. About souls. Are you there? Romans chapter 9. If you'll allow me, I want to read the first five verses from the New Living Translation. You follow along with whatever rendering you have or to be on the screen for you. With Christ as my witness, I speak with utter truthfulness. My conscience and the Holy Spirit confirm it. My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters. I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if that would save them. They are the people of Israel. Chosen to be God's adopted children. God revealed His glory to them. God made covenants with them. He gave them His law. He gave them the privilege of worshiping Him and receiving His wonderful promises. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their ancestors and Christ himself was an Israelite as far as his human nature is concerned. And he is God. The one who rules over everything and is worthy of eternal praise. Can you not hear the passion of Paul's heart? He's talking about his brothers and sisters and he says it troubles me. It it gives me bitter sorrow and unending grief because my people have rejected Jesus. 
know what he was saying? My heart hurts for their soul. After all that God has done for them, after everything He's done to show them His love for them, my heart grieves because they won't accept Jesus. Here's the first thing I wish you'd write down about us having a passion for souls. Here it is. We will never, we can never expect the lost. We will never effect Affect the lost until we really love the lost. We will never affect them until we really love the lost. That's what I wanted you to hear, Paul. Paul said, it grieves me. It is a burden to me. It brings me sorrow when I think about my own brothers and sisters who do not accept Jesus. We will never affect them. Until we love lost people. We have to be able to look past the sin of their lostness. See, that's what we struggle with. We look and say, oh, they're an alcoholic. I don't want to be around that. We can't get past their alcoholism to understand that the reason why they drink is because they're lost. We can't look past their drug addiction. Oh, well, they're a druggie. I'm not going to be caught dead around them. No, you've got to understand, they are a drug addicted because they're lost. I'm not going to get around that person because they do this. Listen, brothers and sisters, until we can get past the sin and understand sinners sin. Until we can understand they're lost. They'll never deal with the sin they commit until they can deal with the issue that their heart is lost. And when they deal with the fact their heart is lost and they accept Jesus, guess what? The sin will begin to fall off them. We need to love the lost. I ran across a poem I want to give you today. You lived next door to me for years. We shared our dreams, our joys, our tears. A friend to me you were indeed. A friend who helped me in my need. My faith in you was strong and sure. We had such trust as should endure. No spats between us e'er arose. Our friends liked us and so our foes. But sadness then, my friend, to find that after all you weren't so kind. The day my life on earth did end I found you weren't a faithful friend. For all those years we spent on earth, you never talked of a second birth. You never spoke of my lost soul and of the Christ who'd make me whole. I plead today from hell's cruel fire and tell you now my last desire. You cannot do a thing for me. No words today, my bonds to free. But do not err my friend again. Do all you can for souls of men. Plead with them now quite earnestly, lest they be cast into hell with me. Until we love the lost, until we can look past their sin and understand sinners' sin. Until we can look past it and understand what we need to do is talk about the second birth and the Savior that can make you whole. We need to talk to them about their lostness and the fact that Jesus saved sinners. We'll never affect them until we love the lost. Here's the second thing I want you to write down that I think is important. Number two, as long as there's breath, there's hope. Aren't you glad people didn't give up on Saul of Tarsus? Saul persecuted the church. Saul, who became Paul, persecuted the church. He did everything he could to stop it. But aren't you glad Jesus didn't give up on him? Aren't you glad Jesus was willing to meet him on the road to Damascus that day and call him by his name and say, I don't care what you've done. I don't care what people may say about you. I want you to understand, I have a work for you to do. As long as there's breath, there's hope. 
Romans 9 15 for he saith to Moses I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion people that we're ready to give up on he's not Romans 9, 25, 26, he saith also to Hosea, this is Hosea, I will call them my people which were not my people and her beloved which were not beloved and it shall come to pass in that place where he was said unto them, ye are not my people, there shall be called the children of the living God. He was talking about the prophecy or the words of Hosea, how that the Lord would come and not only be uh, presented to the Jews, but he was going to reach out to the Gentiles the Gentiles really were not the ones that the Messiah was for but guess what he loved us and he grafted us into the vine and he made us part of the kingdom of God had it not been for the mercy of the Lord none of us none of us I know I know we think we're we're all it sometimes you know how it is I was thinking back the other day Somebody said something about their, their child and school. You know how it is that sometimes things spark a memory and you, and, you, and you go back and you replay things over. You remember how it was? I don't know how, I don't know how it is with girls. But I remember when, when Jonathan was kind of like in middle school. He played basketball a year or two. And, and they would have these these banquets where they gave awards. And, uh, you know, every, every basketball player, football player has this desire to be the most valuable, you know, or the most improved or, you know, something like that. Jonathan always seemed to be left out of that. But he'd always get, you know, the high scholar. And he would always be disappointed. And I told him, son, I want to tell you something. It's going to come a day when all these most valuables, when they graduate out of school, aren't going to another, they won't be able to go to college. They won't be able to do a lot of things because even though they're athletically gifted for here, they may not be athletically gifted for there. But what you do in terms of your education will follow you all the days of your life. So you stick up your head and you be proud. And I remember when he got in high school and they called his name for an award. You know how us guys do. Well, I can't stick out my chest because I can't get it out farther than the rest of me. But I, I watched him. They're not in a hurry to go get it. Come on, I got to go. You know what I saw in that? I saw in that. what God is looking for some of us he's looking for some of us to look down and see us where are you going I'm going to Zacchaeus house today what are you doing going there to a sinner's house that's exactly why I'm going because Zacchaeus is a sinner Jesus said get out of that tree I want to go to your house today why because Zacchaeus was lost he was a thief and a crook he needed what Jesus was offering We need to get it. We need to get it. As long as there's breath, there's hope. And that the Lord will have mercy on whoever he wants to have mercy. And compassion on whoever he wants to have compassion. As long as your lost children are breathing, there's hope. As long as your spouse, your lost spouse is breathing, there's hope. As long as your boss is breathing, there's hope. There's always hope. Here's the third thing. People are stumbling over the stumbling stone. Huh? The stumbling stone. Look at Romans chapter 9, verses 30 through 33. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles which follow not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel which followed after the law of righteousness hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone, a rock of offense. 
Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. They stumbled at the stumbling stone. What? Go back and look at the people he's talking about. First he talks what we'll call sinners. Sinners stumble at the stumbling stone. He talks about the Gentiles. He said the Gentiles were not even living by the law. The Gentiles were not even trying to do anything in relation to God. But somehow the gospel was extended. And they came to faith in Christ. They're sinners who stumble over Christ. Because they really don't know what he's about. All they know is what they're involved in. Look at it from Romans chapter 1, 29 through 32, reading from the New Living Translation. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, maliciousness, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, stabbers, hater of God, insolent, proud, boastful. They invent new ways of sinning. You know, if you live long enough, they'll come up with something you had never heard of before. And they'll disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do it too. They're sinners who are stumbling at Jesus because they don't even know what He's about. All they know is about how sin is pleasant for a season. Anybody tells you that sin is not pleasant for a season is lying to you. The Word says it. It's pleasurable. Started reading a book yesterday by Michael L. Brown. That is a book that says go and sin no more. And it's about the holiness of God. I won't go there. We don't know about Jesus. All we know is about our sin. All we know is that sin has pleasure for a season. And right now, I'm enjoying it. But I want to tell you, sin always has its consequences. And so people are stumbling over Jesus because they really don't understand all about Him. Right now, all I know is I like what I'm doing. And they stumble over Jesus. But you know what we do? We keep telling them. We keep living right in front of them. We keep showing them the example of what Christ is like. We help them understand that life with Jesus is a whole lot better than life without Jesus. You might drink tonight and wake up today, don't even know where you are, can't remember what you did, and have a headache the size of um, Montezuma or somewhere. And I woke up this morning, knew where I was. Was in my right mind. Was excited that today's the day the Lord hath made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. Couldn't wait to get to church to worship Almighty God. I'm telling you it's better. We got people stumbling over Jesus. Sinners. Because they're so bound. It says in 1 Peter 2 and 8. A stone of stumbling. A rock of offense even to them that stumble at the word. Being disobedient. Whereunto also they were appointed. If you go back, the stone, he talks about the chief cornerstone. He's talking about Jesus. We have people that stumble. Sinners. And the second group he talks about are the Jews. And he said, really, they stumble over having faith in the Savior because they've been living so long by the law. They can't understand that all it takes is faith in Him. Because all they've known is trying to live by every letter of the law. They've tried to work hard at keeping the law. And the law has kept them from seeing the Lord that's behind the law. The law was there so that they could understand you will never be able to do what the law says. But there's coming one who is going to be the fulfillment of the law. And in Him is what you need. They were stumbling over Jesus because all they could get their eyes around was the law. And they didn't care what people were saying about Jesus. 
you want to keep the law. Paul tried to help the Galatians with this. Galatians chapter 3, beginning of verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Wait a minute. I'm over here trying to do the works of the law. He said, if you're trying to do the works of the law, you're under a curse. For it's written, Curses everyone that continueth not. And all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. You're not made right because you do the law. You know what makes you right? The just live by faith. Oh, hallelujah. And the law is not of faith, but that the man doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every man that hangs upon the tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Holy Spirit through them. The Jews stumbled. It says it in 1 Corinthians 1, 23. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews. A stumbling block. They were stumbling because they were so intent on keeping the law that they didn't understand faith in Jesus is the fulfillment of what the law was trying to teach. Here's the last thing people stumble over. People st stumble over the simplicity. Do you know there are people right now who lean to this side because surely there's something you've got to do to get saved. Surely, surely you've got to Surely you've got to give so many hours to him a week. Surely, surely you've got to do this. Surely you've got to keep that. Surely you're going to have to Cut your hair. Surely you're gonna to have to, surely you're gonna to have to, surely you're you're gonna to have to do something to get saved. The most simple place I can tell you to go is Acts chapter 16. Paul is in jail. And you know the story. They were singing along about midnight, an earthquake came, the doors flew open. The jailer was going to kill himself for fear that they were gone. And he said, do yourself no harm. We're still here. And he said, tell me what i got to do. Paul said it very simply. Believe on the Lord Jesus. And you and your house can be saved. That's so simple. Yesterday afternoon, I made my way to Magnolia Place to check on Terry Simmons. Terry's got a roommate now. His name is James Crawford. He introduced me to James. It was cordial. Some of his family was there, so I didn't want to interrupt their time. The family left. And Terry started saying, I've been talking to James about Jesus and how he needs to give his life to the Lord. And he said, he's ready. James was quiet. He never said a thing. We got ready to pray. And Terry said, James, don't you want to give your life to the Lord? He said, sure do. So I walked over and grabbed James by the hand. And I looked at him. I said, now, is this what you want to do? He said, yes, sir. I said, you want to do this for you? And he hit himself right here. He said, I want to do it for this. I said, James, I'm going to pray. I pray I want you to pray with me. Grab Terry's hand over here, James' hand over here, and I began to pray a sinner's prayer. And I quoted Romans 10 and 9. And I said, according to what your word said and what James has done, he's now saved. Open up my eyes and tears are running down his face. I want to tell you, I know you may not have to sob and all that, but I still believe there's something to having tears of sorrow for your sin. James Crawford received Jesus yesterday. You want to know why? It was so simple. You might stumble because you're not ready to give up your sin. You may stumble because you think you got to do this and that and the other and you're stumbling over the faith of Jesus. But I'm here to tell you, don't stumble over the simplicity of the gospel. We need, a, we need a passion for souls. We need a passion that says, I love 
lost people. I'll never affect them until I really love lost people. Secondly, I, ha- I can never lose my hope. You may have prayed for them for 25 years. You may have prayed for them for a long time. But I'm telling you, don't lose hope. There are people I pray for every Monday night. If I'm at prayer meeting, I call their name every Monday night without fail. I've been praying for some of them for over 20-something years. But I'm telling you, now is not the time to lose hope. As long as there's breathing, as long as there's breath, there's hope. They're coming to Jesus. Love the lost. Don't give up your hope. And the reason why I told you about this is because when you encounter them, you need to understand what they're thinking. You'll never be able to help someone who is struggling with the law until you can help them. Turn over and see who their stumbling stone is. See, sometimes we think that the stuff that troubles us is named this or that or the other. And the truth is, it's not this, that, and the other. The reason some of us stumble is because we don't know Jesus like we ought to know him. We've got him turned over so we don't have to look at him in the face anymore. You know how it is. Oh, Judge Judy will tell you. When she asks you a question and you start looking your eyes over there, she'll say, ah, don't look over there. Look right here. What some of us need to understand is that it's time to look at Jesus in the eye again. We've got him pushed down and turned over so we don't have to look at him. But if you'll look over and see who he is, see him in all of his glory, see him in his eyes looking at you, his eyes will pierce your heart, my heart. I'm stumbling over him because I'm so so intent on trying to keep my rituals. He's going to show me. That's not where it's at. It's in the simplicity. See him. See his face. See him. We've had him turned over and we've tried to make it so hard. Very simple. We need to understand that sinners don't have a full understanding, revelation of Jesus. We need to help them flip them over. We need to be full of the scripture so that when we start talking to them and they want to go off on a tangent, take us somewhere else that we don't need to go, we need to flip over the stumbling stone who is Jesus and let them see him. Let them hear him speak out of the word. Give them what the word says about Jesus. Do you love lost people? Have you given up hope on any lost people? Are you willing to help people turn over the stumbling stone so that they can see who it is? It is Jesus. It is Him crucified. It is the one we love. It is the one we care about. It is the one who died for us. Get your eyes on Him. Don't get your eyes on Krishna or Buddha or Muhammad or somewhere else. Get your eyes on Jesus. Look full on His wonderful face. Look at Jesus. Father God, I bring this wonderful congregation to you. I understand sometimes things around us create stumbling blocks or obstacles for us. But Lord, felt you so strongly the month of November as you began to talk to me about passion and five specific things that we needed to have passion about we needed to focus on them we needed to think about them we needed to talk about them we needed to have a passion for you for your church for revival and we need to have a passion for souls
Until we love lost souls, we'll never have an impact on them. We'll never affect them. And even if it's we've prayed for years and they have not yet responded, help us, oh God, to understand we can never give up hope. As long as they're breathing, we have hope. And that, Lord, help us to understand the areas that people stumble. Sinners stumble because they're so caught in their sin. Some don't even recognize that what they're doing is such an atrocity to God. But when we can flip over Jesus and help them see who He is and that He died for sin, we understand how much He loves them that He would willingly give His life so they could be freed from all of that. They better can understand to quit stumbling over Him and to receive Him. Help us, Lord, in all we do that even as Christians, We don't allow ourselves to get so involved in our rituals and our routines that we've turned over Jesus so we don't have to see His eyes looking at us trying to tell us that that's not exactly what I had in mind. Or you're you're doing some good stuff, but that's not what I've called you to do. It's not where I'm trying to lead you. It's not what I'm trying to do in you. Help us, Lord, to be filled with Scripture so that those that may stumble over the simplicity of the gospel we'll come to understand it's not by great works that we do it's by great faith in the Savior who's done the work on Calvary this morning I pray that we as a congregation will come together in agreement that we want to have a passion for souls and we want to reach the lost for Jesus we want to make a difference But it starts with us. And so today, Lord, we're going to offer ourselves to you. We're going to ask you to look in us today first. And if there are areas in our life, if we can't answer that question, if there's anything in my life that's become more important to you or to me than you, then I need to rid myself of that. Because nothing should be more important than you. Holy Spirit, move in this place today. Lord, if there's somebody in the room that's lost, I pray today, Lord, that as we turned over the chairs, it was as clear to them inside themselves as it was opening up a chair, getting them to see the exposed Jesus, the face of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the arms of Jesus reaching out, that they'll want to remove sin from their life and receive what Jesus has to offer. Do the work today. We pray in the name of Jesus. Everybody standing all over the building. They're going to sing a song today. The invitation is for two groups of people. Number one is for people in the room who say you know Jesus. But you might have something in your life that has become more important to you than Him. That has created that obstacle in your life. And you want to say to Him, I want obstacles to be gone so that I can be what He wants me to be. I can hear Him when He speaks. I can see Him when He's looking. The second group, if there's anybody here today that doesn't know Jesus, you are lost. What you need is Jesus. We'd love an opportunity to be able to talk to you about Him, to introduce you to Jesus, to flip over the stone so you can see Him for who He really is. Simple. Nothing hard you got to do just by faith to receive Him. As they sing the song, I invite you to come today. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above Him there's no other. Jesus is the way. Come on. Jesus is the Jesus is the
every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm just going to ask this question. Maybe, maybe you just don't want to come. Maybe you're just uncomfortable or whatever. So let me just ask a question. Is there anybody in the room today who does not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? And you really would like to know Him. But for whatever reason, you're not, you're not coming today. But you'd say, Pastor, I'd really like for you to pray for me. That I will do this. And I'll do it soon. Anybody just slip your hand up. I really want to. Is there anybody in the room today, nobody looking, who will say, Pastor Terry, you know what? I want to love lost souls like I've never loved the lost. I don't want anything to hinder me from the burden of the lost. That I'll never lose hope that the lost will be saved. And that I'll become a person who will help turn over the stumbling stone so I can expose Jesus and who He really is to the people who need Him. I really want to love the lost in a way I never have. Would you just slip your hand up? I really want to love the lost. I really do. Father God, all over this building, people raised their hand and said, I really want to love the lost. Lord, help them to understand that loving the lost comes with a burden. Sometimes it'll be heavy. Sometimes it, it will cause them great travail. Sometimes it will cause them much tears and pray. But God, it's the only way. God, we understand that that it also comes with a responsibility. That if we're going to love the lost, we don't just pray for them, but we become responsible to help turn over the stumbling stone so that they can see Jesus. So that Jesus can look at them in their eyes. So that Jesus can begin to speak to them in, in clear ways. That they'll hear Him. I pray, Father God, in the name of Your Son, that God, what we say today, is something that we literally mean today and that will follow through. And because of this love for the lost, we will see an increase of the lost coming to faith in Jesus. Lord, we're going to see because of that, we'll have to have an increase in discipleship, and an increase in a lot of areas because the lost are coming home to Jesus. We thank you in advance for what you're going to do. Go with us throughout the rest of this day. Bring us back to your house tonight, Lord that we can worship you in spirit and in truth. And we'll give you praise for all you do. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you. We love you. So good to see you today. Hope you have a great afternoon.